You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 133 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today we are discussing symbiosis. Symbiosis. This is this is a massive topic. Yep. The, the, this was a bit intimidating to try to put together, but boy, what a cool topic. Symbiosis, as many of us are familiar with the word, but maybe in a more casual sense, is things working together, typically. We're going to discuss it in the biological sense of Different organisms in close association with one another. I'm sure most of our listeners are already thinking of some of their favorite examples. Yes. Oh, there's so many fun ones. We're going to go through, we're going to discuss what the term means, you know, what it encompasses or sometimes encompasses. We're going to talk about what are some of those examples, what are some of the famous you know, and, and fundamental forms of symbiosis in our world. We're, of course, going to look at the fossil record and talk about the times we are able to detect it. And then we will discuss a bit about some of the evolutionary trends and weird cases of evolution that happens because of symbiosis and how some of them have evolved. Yeah, it's going to be good. Oh, it's... I love this topic. (laughs) It's just such a cool topic, and it is uh, surprisingly dense when you just think about it, you're like, yeah, things living together. Sure. Boy, it gets messy real quick. <laughs> <laughs> now, as usual, we are talking about this because it is awesome, but it was also requested. This topic, as well as endosymbiosis, was requested by our listeners, Tobias and Brett. Thanks for that request. Thanks. <laughs> and before we get into the topic itself, let's get some of our announcements out of the way. Our first announcement is some more names to shout out because (laughs) we have a Patreon. Sure do. And our Patreon supports us completely top to bottom and is the reason we're able to do so many cool things. And if you join up on our Patreon, not only do you get access to extra content like bonus news and some extra insights, you know, behind the scenes things from us, we also will shout your name out at certain levels. So for this episode, we would like to welcome Emmanuel, Michael, Thea, Soroka, Elizabeth, Chris, and Anna. Thank you to everybody for joining or for upgrading beyond the level of the shout-out. Yes. Sometimes the people we shout out in this section are people who already were patrons, but bumped up to the appropriate level. Yeah, so thank you for the support. If you want to support us, go check out Patreon. If you want that extra content, check it out. Speaking of ways to get extra goodies, we now have a Discord. We do. We launched it with our five-year anniversary live stream, which you can actually go rewatch on YouTube if you missed it. Mm -hmm. And there you can interact with other members of our fan base and community. You can also interact with us from time to time. We are going on there to do talks and interactions every so often. Yeah, the Discord has been growing since we launched it because from... Because as members have joined in and we've gotten suggestions from members, the mods and our admins have expanded the Discord. There's now a pets channel (laughs) because that was needed. There's now a wildlife channel. There's all it keeps expanding and developing, which is really cool to see. It's awesome. So check that out if you're interested. The link is in the description. So follow that if you'd like to join in. And another way to get bonus goodies, these you have to pay for, though, (laughs) is we have released some new merch for our Zazzle store, some art from our friend Rob and our friend Anna. And you can find them there on shirts and mugs and all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, this is art that we also unveiled during that five-year anniversary live stream, and we're so excited about it, and we've heard a lot of excited response. And so if you like it, please purchase some if you can, share it with your friends. The better this kind of merch does with our audience, the more opportunity we will have to do more of it. Absolutely. So with all of these things, if you, if you like us and you like our podcast and our science education, engaging is the best way to make sure we get to keep doing more of it. So 100%. Social media, Patreon, Discord, buy our merch, however you can manage. <laughs> And with that, we can wrap up our announcements, which means we move to our first official section, the news. News time. Every episode, we gather up some 
recent scientific news articles, research, both in evolution and paleontology, also just earth sciences and sometimes just animals in general, to discuss. It helps keep us all up to date on what's going on. So, David, what's the news? Uh, can I interest you in a dinosaur with the sniffles? All right. All right. It's, yeah. It's pretty yeah. cool. I've seen this dinosaur in that Jurassic Park movie. In that documentary yeah. with Sam Neill. And that's right. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> this is research about an actual real life sauropod. One of the long neck dinosaurs <laughs> that shows evidence of a respiratory infection. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> this is research by Kerry Woodruff et al. in the journal Scientific Reports. And in the blog post, after every episode, there's a blog post with links and pictures for more information. In the blog post, we will link to an article about this news in National Geographic by Riley Black. We have occasionally discussed diseases in the fossil record on the podcast. Episode 84 was about paleopathology, and we've talked about how, though we do occasionally get evidence of disease, it is rare and it is difficult to interpret. Part of that is because most disease stuff is in the soft tissue, yep. the stuff that doesn't fossilize very well. Also, a lot of the tests we would want to do to diagnose a disease, we can't do with fossils. Like, we can't take blood samples and <laughs> chemical tests a lot of the time we've yeah. just got physical remains their blood pressure ain't great no it's it's a real it's a real problem but this is an exception and in fact if the authors are correct in their interpretation this is a first Ooh. for a type of disease found in the fossil record the dinosaur in question is a sauropod again the long-necked long-tailed little foot style dinosaurs nicknamed dolly now, Dolly, uh, incidentally, has not been identified to a genus. It is a type of diplodocid. That's the group that includes Diplodocus and Camarasaurus, those late Jurassic uh, famous sauropods, but not assigned to a genus and species. So officially an indeterminate diplodocid or diplodocid. Neat. Dolly is known from the skull, some neck vertebrae, and some other bones. Originally collected in 1990 from the famous Morrison Formation in Montana, dating to the latest Jurassic around 145 million years ago. Dolly's neck vertebrae have hollow spaces within them. That is not unusual. A lot of sauropods and theropods have that, just like modern birds do. Those are hollow spaces that are interpreted to be a part of a pneumatic system, probably linked to the respiratory system. Sauropods and most theropods, the meat-eating dinosaurs, have the same bird-like respiratory system with air sacs that invade gaps in the bones so their bones contain parts of the respiratory system which is so bizarre and awesome yes inside these hollow spaces in some of dolly's neck vertebrae are bony outgrowths Ooh. which riley in her article describes as almost looking like broccoli <laughs> gross yeah that's not where you want broccoli <laughs> The authors identify these as osteomyelitis, which is a term that just describes swelling or inflammation in the bone. So if our bones get diseased, they can swell and become inflamed just like any other tissue. It's just sounds t more terrible because it's bone. Well, it's a lot less elastic <laughs> than the rest of the tissues. Doesn't feel like it's going to go away quite as easily. Yeah, when I when my swelling goes down in my muscle, it goes back to normal. <laughs> when you swell the stones you've grown to hold your body up. Yeah. Ah! Some diseases can become severe enough to cause inflammation or swelling in the bone. In this case, they interpret it as being associated with a respiratory disease. It is in this respiratory area. There are lots of different kinds of respiratory diseases, but based on the structures that they're seeing, these authors think it is most similar to a modern respiratory disease that birds suffer called air sacculitis. <laughs> which is a great name. That's amazing. It's, a, it's inflammation in the air sacs. Air sacculitis. It's a great name, but it's a terrible uh, thing to, to suffer, it sounds like. It is a pneumonia-like condition. It is an inflammation or infection in the air sacs, typically caused by a variety of microbes. So some diseases are named for the thing that causes them. Yes. This is a general term. It can be caused by bacteria or fungi or viruses, anything that causes inflammation in the air sacs. And if it gets severe enough, it can 
leave evidence on the bone. Oof. Modern chickens, for example, can get it in unclean conditions from E. coli. Now, the authors do note that it is difficult to make a confirmed diagnosis of the disease, but given the evidence we have, this seems most likely. And if this is air sacculitis, or something similar, it is not only super cool that we have evidence of sauropods getting this bird disease in their air sacs, but the first documented case of this disease in the fossil record. Very awesome. And from here, we can make a couple of other inferences. For example, what symptoms this dinosaur might have had. (gasps) Yay. (laughs) So in birds, we see a number of symptoms, which can include coughing, labored breathing, fever, nasal discharge, (laughs) so a runny nose, the sniffles, uh, and even weight loss and diarrhea if it gets bad enough. So this could very well have been a dinosaur. Just the the thought of a sauropod with labored breathing. Yeah. Just that... Just, just what is the wheezing of a sauropod sound like? It's just that for the surrounding area, everyone would just be hearing Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where you went, just... <sighs> just, just an occasional sneeze. <laughs> That's oh, what yeah. I was going to say. We need to confirm whether or not they were physically capable of sneezing. Mm -hmm. And then now we know what the Brachiosaurus had. There you go. In Jurassic Park. Air sacculitis. It's such a good documentary. (laughs) In birds today, air sacculitis is known to spread in cramped conditions. For example, where you have a lot of eggs and a lot of feces, you can get these infections started. And Riley's article points out that sauropods are known to have nested in colonies. Right, right. So it could be that in a nesting colony, maybe there was enough close proximity that those could end up being places where diseases spread. Just like in us, right? Diseases spread. You go to school and you pick up a disease because you're inside buildings with hundreds of other people. Yeah, grouping together in large semblances uh, is a great way to spread disease. That's true. Interesting. Uh, And you can spread it. Sometimes it's like a little bit of spread, but sometimes it's like some sort of uber spread. Weird. Now, anytime we find a fossil with a disease, one of the big questions everyone wants to ask is, is this the disease that killed it? Yeah. Obviously, it's a fossil. (laughs) Why it's in the ground. And as usual, we we don't know that for sure. The authors point out that it could have been fatal. It's not out of the realm of possibility. If the disease gets severe enough, it could be fatal. It could also mean that this dinosaur, for one reason or another, left the group. Mm -hmm. If it was in a herd, maybe it fell behind, or maybe it was having trouble getting enough food. If it was weak and sick looking enough, predators may have targeted. So this this is a disease that could have either directly or indirectly led to the death of the dinosaur. Yeah. But we don't know that for sure. But just being able to infer the presence of this disease and then make some assumptions about the symptoms of a sick dinosaur is very cool. It's No, that's fantastic. Both because... Anytime we can study disease in the fossil record, that that's huge because that is not something we get very often of this thing seems to be show, showing symptoms of a disease we can actually diagnose. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. It's also really cool that it's bird. Yes. That it's something that's potentially similar to what birds get, uh, especially for because, you know, we talk about with theropods all the time. Right. That what we consider bird behavior is very likely just dinosaur behavior, but it doesn't often get connected to the other not bird-shaped dinosaurs as regularly. Well, and also we often talk about it in terms of the good stuff. Yes. We're like, oh yeah, sauropods and theropods had that great avian-style breathing system. Well, they also had the same infections in that breathing system. Absolutely. (laughs) Which is, that's fantastic. And this also is added to the list of my examples of why the more tragic the fossil, the better the paleontology. Yeah. It's, hey, if you can find a dinosaur, awesome. Was it sick? <laughs> <laughs> Was it sick? Did it die horribly? <laughs> yeah. Uh, funnily enough, Carrie Woodruff, the main author, is quoted in Riley's article as explaining one of the reasons that, that this is a particularly cool find. And I'm just going to read the quote <laughs> from Woodruff. We've all had many of the same symptoms and likely felt just as crappy as Dolly did. I don't personally know of any fossil I've been able to sympathetically relate to more. (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) A very good point. That's fantastic. Well, the creatures in my next article were not suffering from nasal discharge. Okay. But they do seem to have experienced oral discharge. Sure. 
These are fossil pterosaurs that seem to have regurgitated pellets. Gotcha. Not that they were drooling all over them. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Slobbering no. like a dog. Yeah, no, no. Uh, maybe before they ate. When sure. they were hungry. <laughs> Coughing up pellets like an owl or uh, another bird of prey. Yes. Cool. These seem to be food pellets regurgitated by pterosaurs. That's cool. Because we've found those for ancient birds. Mm-hmm. But to my knowledge, I don't know that we found those otherwise for pterosaurs. No, this would be the first cool. if it is indeed. This is research by Shunqing Zhang et al. in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, Biological Sciences. <laughs> and the article is by Carolyn Gramling in Science News. So pterosaurs, the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic, questions as to what they ate have been a big part because we don't, we don't always find feeding traces and we don't find them with stomach content very often. So that has been a big debate on like, it's thought very often that they likely ate fish, but we don't have direct evidence for a bunch of the different groups. This is a case where we have what seems to be direct evidence in the form of food pellets. These are two specimens of a species known as Cunpenopterus sinensis, a juvenile and adult it seems, so notably different sizes. They would be from the late Jurassic and were found in China. So we're talking about somewhere between 146 and 199 million years old. Okay. Both are associated with bromelites, regurgitated pellets, which first immediately rings the bell of, oh, did pterosaurs regurgitate food pellets? Yeah, that's a big question. That's a big question. And it sure does seem, because these are indeed food pellets, they are full of fish scales and fish regurgitated material like those owl pellets you may have dissected in school exactly so that's definitely what these seem to be and they are closely associated with the skeletons Uh, this gives us some insights into what the biology of these pterosaurs likely was like first off it's just the fact that they had anti-peristalsis or regurgitating abilities right the ability to throw up on command yep and it likely means that they had some Things similar to the two-sectioned, the two-part stomach that we see in other organisms that do this. One for acidifying the food and another gizzard-like section for grinding it up. Right. Birds have, a lot of birds have this today. And the ones that cough things up, they're coughing it up from that grinding area, I believe. Yes. So they're not, it's not coming up with bile like when we regurgitate that's our body going oh no yeah that's not supposed to happen (laughs) well sometimes it's supposed to happen but you don't want it to happen that's that is something has gone wrong (laughs) and that is the only option put it in reverse (laughs) yep that's the only option our body sees to fix it (laughs) like when something's stuck in the vacuum exactly (laughs) but this is on purpose this is something their body was able to do naturally Birds will do this to, like, cough up bones and stuff that they're not going to digest. And that's the whole point of these pellets, is that when you swallow food whole, you're going to swallow a bunch of things that you may not be able to easily digest or digest at all. You know, your stomach may not be able to handle scales and bones, and instead of passing those sharp, rough, you know, obtrusive things, you just bring it back up since you're already near the entrance. They were also able to look at the scales, the fish scales inside the pellets, and get some insights into what kind of food they were likely eating. Uh, Now, they did not mention a specific fish for sure, uh, but they do seem to be of the same kind of fish. Okay, in both pellets? In both pellets. Very similar scales, ganoid scales. And they were able to make some observations. The smaller pellet from the smaller pterosaur had smaller scales. All right. With bigger scales in the adult's pellet, which suggests that they were aiming for fish their size, you know, that matched their growth series where they were in their growth. They weren't just taking the same sized fish their whole life. Adults were going for bigger fish, it seems, which could potentially be the same fish, Mm -hmm. meaning they while they went through their ontogeny, they were feeding on another fish through its ontogeny. (laughs) (laughs) It is also notable that the scales in the larger pellet are larger on average than the typical fish found in the surrounding fossil site material, which could mean that these parents, these are these adult pterosaurs were targeting larger fish, that they were going for bigger meals. They weren't just taking the average sized fish because it's not the size scale they typically are finding. Interesting. I wonder if that would also potentially mean that they were traveling afar to get their fish. Right. 
it does indicate that they were likely active hunters. Mm -hmm. They weren't just scooping up whatever floated by. Exactly. Or what washed up or something that they were targeting these fish very purposefully. Mm. Uh, So a, it tells us yeah, the, at least this group did eat fish. So they are fish eaters. Like often pterosaurs are suspected to be. And we see a difference in the size of fish that they are targeting at different times in their life. That's very cool. I wonder, I didn't read this article, so I don't know. I wonder what else lived in that environment. It's it's one of the big issues with something like bromelites or coprolites is linking them to the animal that it came from. Mm -hmm. The implication that these came from pterosaurs is very exciting because that's something that would make total sense for pterosaurs. Yes. Intuitively that, yeah, well, sure. You're living a lot like a bird. It makes total sense that you might do a lot of the things birds do. And they also pointed out that this is not necessarily surprising from a phylogenetic standpoint. A lot of other archosaurs, birds, but also crocs and their cousins. And there are fossil evidence of other archosaurs. Like this is not unusual among pterosaur relatives. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I can think of even some snakes that do it. Mm -hmm. Egg-eating snakes, although they don't have gizzards and stuff. (laughs) Regurgitating the thing you can't digest is relatively common. Yes, A very cool insight into pterosaur biology. It's awesome. Well, if you want to hear more about pterosaurs, go check out episode 79, where I expound upon how awesome pterosaurs are. And speaking of awesome reptiles, my next bit of news is about snakes. Okay. Specifically, genetic evidence for the evolution of certain Australian snakes from an unexpected genetic source of change. Okay. This is venomous snakes and sea snakes and jumping genes. It's it's super cool. <laughs> this is research by James Galbraith et al. in the journal Genes. And we will link to a press release in the blog post by Crispin Savage from the University of Adelaide on phys.org. So this one requires a little bit of background explanation. There is a feature of our genomes known as transposable elements, also known as transposons, also known more colloquially as jumping genes. These are sections of DNA that can move around within the genome. Yeah, see, it's it's not actually the the gene that's jumping, but the little. It's not the gene for jumping. Yeah, it's it's well, it's the it's the larva that's in the gene that trying to get right, out of the sunlight. What, that's what's moving. It <laughs> <laughs> These are sequences in our genes. So if you think of your chromosomes, there are little chunks of chromosomal DNA that will occasionally break off or duplicate and send the duplicate somewhere else. And these are just little parts of the genome that are hopping from place to place, reorganizing within the genome now and then. These are often studied because they are an important source of diversity, genetic diversity, and mutations if our genes are just rearranging themselves in little ways. These have been known for quite a while. Something that is coming more and more to our understanding, from what I've read, is that these jumping genes also have the interesting habit of jumping between organisms. And I don't mean like when organisms reproduce, a gene will go, I jumping across entire phyla of life. This is a form of horizontal gene transfer. I think maybe we've talked about this before on the podcast. Yes. Horizontal gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer usually means parent to offspring are inheriting genes. Horizontal means across unrelated lineages. Most famously, this happens in bacteria. Bacteria have actual mechanisms, I think, that allow them to just swap chunks of genes with each other. It's like like docking tubes on a spaceship. Yes. They connect, (laughs) they share some of their DNA, and they go about their ways now slightly more each other. But this can happen across all forms of life. There have been a number of studies now that have shown plants, animals, fungi exhibiting genes that they seem to have picked up from other plants, animals, fungi. And like animals from plants and animals from fungi and birds from fish and, you know, all sorts of weird stuff. And it's like, you know, okay, bacteria do that, but bacteria are bacteria. Yeah. Now there are a few different uh, thoughts about how it happens. We don't fully understand this, but it's been suggested, for example, that a spawning grounds might be a place where this happens, especially for animals like fish, where you're just kind of shooting your genetic material out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of eggs and stuff floating around, like gametes could easily end up contacting DNA from other things. 
It's thought that parasites and pathogens might be vectors of the spread of genes from one organism to another, because they're also getting in the body and in the cells and swapping genes. It is a thing that has been noted that commonly happens between organisms, particularly uh, things like animals and plants, living in similar habitats in close proximity. So, for example, two species living in a symbiotic relationship, Ah, like the episode, topical, might switch their genes. Now, transposons, the jumping genes, are known, it seems, to do this pretty commonly, which makes a lot of sense if any genes are going to do it. The ones that are already commonly bouncing around are more likely to do it. This study, now that we've gotten the background out of the way, is looking at jumping genes in elapid snakes. Elapids include cobras, coral snakes, and a bunch of the most famous Australian snakes, which are the ones we're going to talk about today. 30 million years ago, a branch of Asian elapid snakes split off and made it to the Australo-Melanesian area, Australia and the surrounding area. About 30 million years ago today, that branch includes more than 150 species of sea snakes, sea crates, which are semi-marine, they're amphibious, and land snakes, including tiger snakes, brown snakes, taipans, all, just all the stuff in Australia that they tell you not to go near. Mm-hmm. This study looked at the jumping genes in these snakes to see to look for evidence of horizontal transposon transfer that give clues to the evolutionary history of these snakes. All right. And they found a bunch of stuff, but the most exciting part and the headline making part and the part I'm going to talk about <laughs> is the relationship between the this group of snakes and their fellow organisms in the ocean. What? This study found that both sea snakes and sea crates, which are two different lineages that went to the ocean separately, both exhibit unique jumping gene sequences that are not close to other snakes and squamates and reptiles, but are typically seen in fish and other marine animals. Oh. Which suggests that these these lineages picked up these genetic sequences when they moved into ocean environments. As they became marine, as they transitioned into that new habitat, they were picking up these genes. And in some cases, these horizontally transferred genes make up a significant percentage of the snake genome. So as I think it was the press release points out, this means not only that changing your habitat as a species can have a direct impact on your genetics, not only the other way around, but that it means that many of the major genetic differences between these land snakes and sea snakes are not genes from the snakes. Yeah. They are genes they picked up from elsewhere. Yeah, we are going to become one with the ocean now. (laughs) Just absorb. (laughs) Absorb all of it. That gene transfer between vertebrates is so weird to me. Right. It seems like it shouldn't be able to function. It it seems wrong. You got a little bit of fish DNA in you. That's why you have cancer. Like, that's. (laughs) it feels like it should be one of those situations. Yes. (laughs) No, apparently it happens all the time we're just constantly exposed to environmental dna from the surroundings from prey from parasites that are hopping from one to the other just all sorts of stuff yeah uh but that's not actually the coolest part (laughs) the coolest part is the other thing they found i'm pretty sure it is so like i said the ancestors of all of these australo-melanesian elapid snakes came down from asia around 30 million years ago at a time where there were a bunch of islands connecting, and it has long been suggested that, yeah, they were probably following these islands. Uh, island hopping is something we've talked about before, uh, well, way back in episode four about <laughs> islands and way back in episode 24 about sloths. Well, these authors found that four of the horizontally transferred sequences that they identified are shared among all of this group of snakes, all the Australomelanesian ones. And three of the ones they identified seem to have come from ocean organisms. Oh. Which suggests that the ancestors of this region's elapids picked up those marine genes, which seems to suggest that their ancestors were at least partially aquatic. 
Yeah. There has been previous research that has thought, all right, well, maybe they were island hopping, you know, land snakes moving from island to island. They could have also have been marine or semi-marine to make it down there. This is, according to the evidence, the first, as they call it, tangible evidence that the ancestors of this group of snakes, including both the ones that have since gone back to the ocean and the land ones, their ancestors were marine or semi-marine. Wow. The authors also point out that this, if, if they're right, this would be the first time jumping genes have been used to confirm the evolutionary history of a group of animals. That's awesome. How cool is that? Wow. Like, the, and it makes... Their ancestors picked up genes from the ocean environment the same way the crates and sea snakes have separately. But ba- before they diversified into a bunch of different sea and land snakes. Yep. And it, and it makes sense. Like, it, it's much easier to island hop if you can swim between the islands. Yeah. And that makes tons of sense. But it's such a cool bit of evidence. And I I love it because just saying, like hey, the sea snakes and sea crates have gotten genes from being in the ocean. Yeah. That's that's cool. And it seems their ancestors did too. Cool. Then being able to connect that to, that may tell us how they got to where they are now. Yeah. That's awesome. This was a piece of news that I saw it on our list. And I, I, at first glance, I thought, well, this seems like it might not make it into the news. This Mm. might be a little bit too technical or a little bit too esoteric. And then I started reading it. And I was like, all right, we're talking about elapid snakes. Very cool. All right. Horizontal. I had to do a bunch of extra digging to make sure I understood Mm. what horizontal transposon transfer means. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a cool study because that's a cool concept. These are snakes that have fish genes. Yep. And genes that we most often see in things like sea turtles and sea squirts. Like you, these, we are picking up. DNA and sequences of our genomes from the environment that can alter our genome. And then we uh, scientists can track that into the evolutionary history. And the fact that it's about snakes at this point, it practically is just icing. <laughs> uh, this would have been an awesome study about any group of animals, <laughs> but it's about snakes. This is the best news ever. <laughs> well, I love the concept of how widespread the horizontal genes gene transfer is because it really it blows a hole in the whole idea of like oh yeah no you're an enclosed (laughs) being you know you are you it's like well you know for now yeah these are my (laughs) genes except for the ones that aren't yep (laughs) like (laughs) give it a couple generations who knows what you'll pick up (laughs) awesome well i that i don't know how i could follow that other than some news about crocodiles (sighs) Specifically a crocodile that seems to have eaten a dinosaur. All right. Well, now you're just going for sensationalism. (laughs) (laughs) This is croc gut content that seems to be the first instance confirming that they ate dinosaurs for sure. All right. right. That's that's actually pretty awesome. (laughs) This is research by Matt White et al. in Gondwana Research. And the article is by Victoria Pengilly in ABC News. So since you quoted your article, I also want to quote one of the lines, the opening line of the article, sure. uh, which was, crocodilians are among Earth's most successful hypercarnivores. That's right. true. Just just wanted to put that's that a, out yeah, there. That's a great, that's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> the reason they make that point, though, is they've been, crocodilians and the overall group has been around since the Mesozoic. Mm-hmm. And we know that they've been predatory and successfully predatory for quite some time. But a lot of the evidence of their predation is feeding traces. Right. Bite marks and yeah. stuff. We have gotten cut gut content and we have gotten coprolites, I know. Uh, but their digestion is also very harsh. So it like they turn most of their food to paste when they digest it. And we have gotten these sort of bite marks and feeding traces on dinosaur bones before. But we've never gotten direct dietary evidence like gut content. To confirm, to show this one has eaten a dinosaur. Right. So it's always been heavily implied by the evidence, but we've never gotten that that golden bullet, that smoking gun, until now it seems. Ooh. This is a new crocodiliform, new species, Confractosuchus soroctonos. Wow. Which basically translates to 
broken dinosaur killer. <laughs> That's this is like a Greek god. <laughs> It was it not a huge croc. It was two and a half meters, so okay. it's not a massive one. This was found in Australia, uh, somewhere around 100 million years old. But the thing that's making it such big news is that inside its body cavity, seemingly gut content, are the remains of a juvenile ornithopod dinosaur. Oh. They don't know what kind of ornithopod yet. Right. The ornithopods is the very big group yes. that includes your, quote, duck bills, your hadrosaurs, your hypsilophodons, I think, are in there. It's all those. Uh, the, the ones that aren't the horned ones and the armored ones and the meat-eating ones. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that whole group. Yep. Uh, the article, compa- to to explain it for everyone, used Ducky from Land Before Time. Sure. There you uh, go. And it was like, so just picture Ducky. Being eaten by a croc. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> Wasn't the croc in the second one? Yeah. Or, yeah, <laughs> or the third one? I, one I of think those. it was the third one. Uh, it was a big dinosuchus that was blind and had a bird that helped it see. Yes. Yeah. Maybe it was the fourth one. Yeah. It anyway. Was, it was one of those. Not only are the remains where we would expect them to be for gut content, but there is evidence on the bones that it was eaten by a croc. Some diagnostic evidence because we find these kind of feeding traces on modern Kills by crocs. <laughs> They're still eating stuff. <laughs> this evidence includes signs of oral processing, so bite marks. Sure, chewing. Carcass reduction, meaning dismemberment. Yeah. <laughs> it has been pulled <laughs> apart. <laughs> and the bones have been fragmented. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, th- these are all things that are very commonly seen in the meal of a croc. Right, damage incurred on the way. Yes, which would make this the first time a croc... Cousin has been found with dinosaur remains in its belly. That is very cool. This also lines up with the anatomy of Confractosuchus. Uh, its skull shows it to be a macro generalist. So think of like your Nile crocs, where it is good at taking down basically whatever it wants, but it's also good at taking down big stuff. So it's eating, it probably was eating a bunch of stuff, but it it fits, the skull fits that it would be taking down stuff like this young dinosaur. And on a, another fun little tidbit to it, these are the first ornithopod bones from this site. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Mr. Croc. Yeah, thanks for keeping those safe for us. <laughs> they had found teeth before and they had found tracks. So they knew ornithopods were around, but they hadn't actually found skeletal material. And here is this wonderful croc just collecting them for us. <laughs> I'm sorry, little guy, but this is for scientists down the line. <laughs> for science? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very cool discovery because this is one of those things that I would have been immensely surprised if crocs weren't eating dinosaurs because yeah, they're crocodiles and, and crocodile relatives of a range of different sizes and dinosaurs came in a range of different sizes. And we know a lot of these ancient croc relatives were likely living and hunting like modern crocs. And if dinosaurs were around today, modern crocs and gators would absolutely be eating the smaller ones. Yeah, if they were there and drinking water. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it wouldn't make any sense for them not to unless they were toxic or something weird. (laughs) So it makes total sense to expect this, but to have actual evidence of it is a very cool find. Well, and one of the points that the researchers and in the article is made is that this also brings light and focus to the fact that dinosaurs were part of a complicated food web. You know, it's so often portrayed that during the Mesozoic, dinosaurs were at the top and they were eating each other, but like there was dinosaur world. But no, like small dinosaurs were being eaten by non-dinosaurs. Yeah. And they were just part of the food web. They were just like anything is today. A very cool find, a very cool first, a finally a confirmation of crocs eating dinosaurs, and only about 10 years after the first discovery of a snake that was probably eating dinosaurs. (laughs) So good job catching up. (laughs) One final cool note. That was Sanajev from India, the one found in a sauropod nest. Very cool. (laughs) Confractosuchus is a better name. Oh, are you done? Uh, they did have to use x-rays to study it because pretty cool. it was too delicate to remove from the stone. <laughs> that is very cool. <laughs> Let's talk about symbiosis now. I'm done. Organisms that get along. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to wrap up the news. So now we can move to our main topic of symbiosis. I'm and, excited. And what is it?
Symbiosis is probably one of the easiest terms to define that we've done on this podcast, at least on the surface. It's right there in the name. It's in the name. Two organisms living together. Symbiosis. (laughs) Yeah, it's two things living in close association with one another. That could be living in close behavioral connection on one another. Mm -hmm. As long as it's two things together, symbiosis. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. But of course, no, it's not. Right. End of the episode. (laughs) Thanks for coming. This has been great. (laughs) No, this is a vast and extremely nuanced topic. There is much debate as to exactly how to define different types of symbiosis. But in generally, the basic definition is two organisms of different species that is almost always specified. You know, me and David are not in biological symbiosis because we're roommates. (laughs) Right. A family living together is not a symbiotic relationship. No. It's a family. Arguably, you and Rev the cat. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Could be considered in symbiosis. She's my dependent. You'd be called her host. I would, unless you asked her. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, typically, different species... Sometimes it's specified that they are phylogenetically distant from one another, and other times that it's that's not specified. That is something you will find with this term. The definitions vary quite a bit, which we will be discussing here at the onset of our discussion. Often, the bigger organism is called the host, and the smaller organism is either called the symbiote or the symbiont. And depending on which term you use just depends on which... Uh, historical term you want to go with symbiote is the greek word for companion okay so that's that's where that comes from and so many people prefer it because it's originally linguistically correct Uh, but symbiont was the term introduced alongside the concept of symbiosis sure so So, either way so you'll hear both both are fine (laughs) so sometimes you won't hear the host symbiont distinction They're just both symbionts with each other. Right. It depends. Now, under the broad definition of symbiosis, this includes everything from things working together, things working against each other, to just occupying the same space, not... Happening to be alongside. Yeah, not hugely affecting, or at least both aren't being affected. Mm -hmm. I saw one really great paper that called it a continuum from antagonism to cooperation. Okay, that's a great way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. So often, and we are about to, we yes. are about to put it in boxes. Yes, but we are. Yeah, the, the boxes don't really work. So thinking of things as a spectrum is a much better way to do it a lot of the time. Absolutely. This is not something where a relationship absolutely flows this way and no other. You can have one symbiosis relationship that is m- more beneficial, but a little a little more take on one side, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not actually even. Right. Or it's more beneficial on a Tuesday, but yes. maybe not the next day. <laughs> and these relationships can shift. What was beneficial for both can suddenly become only beneficial for one mm-hmm. and could suddenly become detrimental to one. So this is not a set thing, but here are your terms. Yeah, so vocab. <laughs> here are the boxes. <laughs> Mutualism is two partners that are benefiting from the partnership. Right. I'm thinking of those cleaner fish. Yes. Where it's like, yeah, one fish is getting its teeth cleaned and the other one is getting a meal. Yeah. Both are benefiting symbiotic relationships. Yes. This is what most people think of when you say symbiosis. When things are living in symbiosis, they typically think of things, situations where two organisms are quote unquote helping each other. Right. Coral and algae. Yes. Right? One gets a house, one gets nutrition. Commensalism is where one partner is benefiting and the other one's mostly unaffected. Yeah. This makes me think of something like a dust mite. Yeah. Or like our skin is covered in little bugs that are eating the dead skin cells and stuff like that. And we don't even notice them. Yes. They're making a whole living that way. And we we just go along with our lives. Yeah. It's it's just situations where one is... Take it either taking from the other or just gaining some side effect benefit. You know, being able to be on a bigger organism and predators are less likely to bother you. Oh, yeah. You could even argue that animals that build a nest in a tree. Yeah. Right. You are gaining a massive benefit from the tree. And in many cases, the tree probably doesn't care. Yeah. 
you the tree is just being a tree regardless that's commensalism uh this is an extremely common form of symbiosis mm-hmm. uh it just doesn't get as much attention right this is all your your stowaways and yes. your hitchhikers what typically are considered the more boring versions which is why we don't discuss them in documentaries as often right because it's like <laughs> there's the beavers you know den and the beavers are living here and there's some uh are they muskrats Oh, other things that will live yeah. in there. And here's some other things from the lake that are living in here. Moving on. Yep. <laughs> All right. But it is symbiosis. And then finally, and somewhat contradictorily, parasitism. Yep. Parasitism is two organisms living in close association with one another, except one is benefiting and the other is suffering. Yes, we did a whole episode about parasites. Yes, back we did. In episode 102. So these are your classic, you know tapeworm yep. right which is inside the body of a host and it is taking the food and can even make the host sick yes that's something that can be commensal until you start noticing the ill effects at which point now it's parasitic yep but still symbiotic or a mosquito right is feeding directly off of another thing getting a benefit and potentially harming the host could be considered parasitic yes now as we said categorizing these categories is not actually always straightforward when dealing with the natural world. There are things that, like the tapeworm, are typically one, then could become the other. Right. There are situations where you could start in one, and then the environment changes, the situation changes, and you shift to another. And it is not a consistent set of categories. But the concept is basically both benefit, one benefit, One benefit, one suffers. Right. Then there are also categories for how the two symbiotes are associated with one another. Not how they're affecting one another, but where they are. Like physically. Physically. Physical relationship. Ectosymbiosis or exosymbiosis is outside. Right. The dust mites on our skin. Uh, In our example of the bird in the nest, Mm -hmm. these are things on the outside of the host organism. Yeah. These are the ones you can see very easily because... There's two things. Yeah, even the cleaner fish. Mm -hmm. That is outside. Endosymbiosis is internal. A symbiote is inside its host. Yeah, that's our tapeworm Mm -hmm. and all of our microbes that live inside of our bodies. Yes. Now, there is still also levels to this at times. Of course. Where endosymbiosis is inside the body, but not inside the cells. Okay. And then endocytobiosis <laughs> is inside the cells. Like a virus. Yes, like viruses or the algae inside coral that actually houses in their cells. Oh, yeah, good point. So there are even levels of that. You won't always see that distinction. Very often cellular symbiosis will still be called endosymbiosis because it's a category of it. But other times endosymbiosis just means inside the body cavity. Right. Inside, among your tissue, but not inside it. (laughs) Yes. And then there was another use for endosymbiosis. Yes. uh, Which I believe we will discuss later. Absolutely. And that was one where it would actually be endocytobiosis. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And this is the notion of cells living within cells. Yes. uh, And sort of becoming stuck that way. Yeah. Which we will uh, get to. Now, all of these terms are kind of a mess. And many things you will read about symbiosis will say that that the terminology surrounding this concept is unclear at times and not always well-defined, at least agreed upon in its definitions. You will see different specific definitions given in various studies. And this has actually been the case basically since the onset of the term symbiosis. So the concept of symbiosis first arose back in the 1800s, in the 1860s to 70s, when people first noticed that lichens were a fungus and an algae together. Right. They're not on or an organism, not Mm -hmm. a species. It is multiple species. And this was what first brought on that idea of a symbiotic relationship, but they had not used that term yet for it. Mm -hmm. A researcher, Simon Schwendener, in 1868, who studied lichens, uh, called it the dual hypothesis of the the dual relationship of these two organisms. And the first time a term was suggested was consortium, which was suggested by Johannes Renke in 1873. The term, the term symbi, symbiotismus is the, is the first time we hear the form of the word Hmm. in 1877 by Albert Bernard Frank. 
but they are not the ones that are typically attributed with the term. Because a, a year later, Anton de Berry presented the concept in a symposium, The Phenomena of Symbiosis. Okay. And that's typically where you will see the origin of the term credited to, is de Frank. Right. This is very reminiscent of basically any time we talk about historical stuff in science, that there is all this progenitor conversation typically that ends up in the form that we are familiar with. Yep. Uh, and indeed, when you were mentioning, this is all, all these dates that you've mentioned are the same time period that Darwin was releasing the first, at least first couple editions of On the Origin of Species. Yep, yep, yep. Now, I, I looked up, I, I saw, I found a number that mentioned, even though Frank is almost certainly, historically, the first to suggest this kind of term, it's it's just never credited to them that way. Huh. <laughs> I guess we just don't like that person. I don't know. <laughs> it made somebody angry. And then, after the term was introduced, now when DeBerry introduced the concept, the actual term, it was meant to be a broad, all-encompassing term for mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Did not matter how the organisms were interacting, if they were in close association and not the same species, it was symbiosis, according to DeBerry. And then almost immediately people started using it synonymously with mutualism. Okay. And so for decades... There were kind of two terms, symbiosis, things living together, symbiosis, things living mutualistically. Interesting. Mutualistically, so helping each other. Helping one another. Actually benefiting each other. Which is how we use symbiosis in general language. Yes. When we say people are symbiotic, we mean they go well together. Right. We don't mean, <laughs> yeah, they live next to one another. Well, and it's like you said before about, we don't often hear about commensal relationships, Typically, if we're talking about symbiosis, we're talking about helpful, beneficial relationships. And as you alluded to, even though harmful relationships are technically symbiosis by this broad definition, we are more likely to just call it parasitism. Yep. So even still today, it's very common for symbiosis to more strictly end up referring to beneficial arrangements. Absolutely. Like this is not a, an issue that's gone away. And there's a bunch of discussion about all right, but is should we get rid of, should we settle on a term, mm -hmm. you know? And for years, basically, people have just had to specify or you've just had to interpret what they meant when they sent symbiosis. There's even been other breaking up of the terms suggested. Pathogenism has been suggested to encompass parasitism and other diseases. Gotcha. Pathogens and parasites. Yeah. As to be grouped separately. But, at least according to the papers that said this, more modern-day people are starting to lean back toward DeBerry's general definition. Okay, that makes sense. It's it's how we're going to discuss it in this episode, because we're not right. going to separate out... We're Team DeBerry. Yeah. But also, it makes it much easier for my notes. Right. Uh, ooh, man, <laughs> so much easier that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, nice, nice, nice boxes. Yes. This is what we want. <laughs> so... That seems to be the way the research has been kind of leaning over the last couple decades, but it, there still are moments where there's confusion as to what this term actually encompasses and bafflement when you include mosquitoes <laughs> as a list of symbiotes. There's also been criticism in some of the side terminology used when we talk about symbiosis, as in things like cooperation, partnerships helpful right which lends a very anthropomorphic uh what they call teleological mm -hmm. uh bend to the word which is that there is a purpose and an a, a concerted effort right. behind the symbiosis that's going on right let us algae and coral hold hands and shake and make an agreement yes. we are going to help each other with all our powers united <laughs> we will stand against the sponges right no it's these creatures these organisms are living in association with one another, but they're not actively being like, well, if I don't do this, the coral's going to be real unhappy. Right. There, it, It's generally speaking, it's, very, it's pretty safe to say that one partner in a symbiotic relationship does not actually care to the extent that an organism can care about stuff. Yep. About the well-being of the other organism. I, I, especially in the case of something like you know, when it's something very small living on or in another organism, that's just their house. Yep. 
Like, yeah, it'd be a real shame if my house died, but, you know, it's just the house. Perfect example, coral and their algae, when it gets too hot, the algae leaves. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. That's what cor- coral That's what... bleaching is. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, another interesting thing about the development of this concept in this field of study is that early on it was kind of thought that these were oddities, you know, weird situations of like, oh, look, those two living together. That's weird. Right. (laughs) Oh, mass hysteria. (laughs) Yes, exactly. As we've continued to study the natural world and study this concept, we've come to realize that it's actually the norm. Mm -hmm. Symbiosis is ridiculously common. Almost, I've seen a number of things defined as underlying all of biology. When you actually get down to things like microbes, there's almost nothing that is not a symbiote with something else. Right. To Basically, some... all macroscopic <laughs> organisms are a host. Yes. To microscopic organisms. So you can't avoid it. It just is. You're a host whether you want to be or not. Yeah, you're in symbiosis right now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some of the most noteworthy and weird and cool. And our favorite. And our favorite. I feel the best one to start with are lichens, since that's what started the whole discussion historically. Lichens are... It, if you've seen a lichen, you probably haven't noticed it much, because they're like the crusty, colorful growths on rocks. Yeah, you'll see them on rocks, you'll see them on trees, living and dead trees. Mm-hmm. And when I was younger, I used to think that it was just some kind of moss. Yeah. I remember I would get moss and lichens confused as a kid, because, yeah, it's just sort of a coating of certain surfaces. Yeah, they're very well known for living in harsh habitats. Uh, these are ecosystem engineers in that they can slowly break down stone. Yeah, and... they are they are pioneer organisms. Mm-hmm. They are often some of the first, organ- in some cases, the first living things to make it to an otherwise inhospitable environment. Either because, you know, a new island formed in the ocean or a forest, a fire destroyed a whole area or something. Yes, They are ridiculously successful. There's 15,000 species, Mm -hmm. but they are not an organism in and of themselves. They are a fungus housing algae or cyanobacteria. Right. So you'll have these algal or cyanobacterial cells in a net of fungus. Yes. So basically the fungus acts as the structure and then the algae or bacteria photosynthesizes, gets food from the sun, shares that food with the fungus... Once again, we're using those anthropomorphic terms, but they're very convenient. (laughs) They give some of that to the fungus, and the fungus not only gives it structure, but will also give it nitrogen Mm -hmm. and sources like that. And then they benefit one another and form a lichen. So the like this is such a interesting form of symbiosis in that it is not just two organisms living together, the structure a lichen. That that thing yeah. doesn't exist without the symbiosis. Yes, they formed a new thing. The fungus doesn't grow in that shape unless it's in symbiosis with its algae or its cyanobacteria. It doesn't activate the lichen genes. Like Those genes stay dormant until they are in contact with their symbiote. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, and maybe you're going to get to this, but I remember hearing at some point that a lot of the species of algae and fungus that are known to be part of lichens aren't known outside of lichens. Yeah, it's very interesting, the the range and diversity of lichens, because you have some where their association with each other is so close that if you separate them, it is hard to culture them, to grow them. Even if you're feeding them in a lab, they won't grow well until they're back into that lichen form. The structure that's created is called a thallus so until they're back into the thallus they won't do well Uh, and then there are others where the lichens the fungus forms the lichen by abducting free roaming algae (laughs) you're a lichen now yeah which could almost be called parasitic yeah (laughs) it's predatory in that it captures algae and then becomes a lichen And I've heard discussion about whether or not lichen, because the traditional description of lichens is mutualism. Yes. That's like, yeah, you are exchanging nutrients, uh, the fungus is providing a house and so on. But I've heard discussions that uh, lichens, at least certain lichens, might be better considered a parasitic relationship. Absolutely. Because the fungus is feeding off the algae. Yeah. And in those examples, capturing the algae. And 
it's very interesting because lichens can grow vegetatively. Like just I spread out and now there's two of me because we grew so far apart. But yeah, we, also, we spread out and then something stepped on the middle and now we are two lichens. Yep. Oh, hey. But they also can create spores like most funguses do. And when they do that, those spores have to find new algae because they can't take it with them. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to find that. And if you're one of the fung- fungi that can't survive without your host, with your, your partner, then you're, you die. So it is a very interesting relationship. It's also very complicated because I, I said earlier, there's 15,000 species of lichen. Mm-hmm. We, we do that. We give lichen species. Yeah. Lichens get their own species name. But they're not an organism. They're not a species. They're not a species. <laughs> and it really does mess up. How do you categorize them? Do you categorize them as two species? But the lichen has its own attributes. Yeah. And to complicate things further, I seem to remember a study from not too long ago that pointed out that at least some, maybe many, lichens actually contain more than two species. Yep. Yep. That you can have multiple species of algae and or fungus in the same lichen. So a lichen might be three or four species of symbionts living together. Yes, there are absolutely lichens where it's a fungus with algae and cyanobacteria Mm -hmm. that has both, both photosynthesizing for it. So you could have an amalgam of organisms. And yeah, what do you call that? (laughs) (laughs) But despite how weird they are, they are extremely important very common like we said they tend to be some of the first organisms in new ecosystems and they can break down rock to start creating soil for the eventual benefit of plants that might come to live there so these are important organismal things yeah they're like fundamental to the building of ecosystems as we recognize them and it only works when you have a consortium Mm -hmm. Of microbes together. Yes. Also, uh, on the note of the terms, if anyone notices that I decided to use symbiote instead of symbiont, if you know me, you probably know why. Yeah. I'm going to call, if I can use the word symbiote (laughs) as often as possible, we're going to talk about symbiotes. Yeah, I'm going to bring that up again later. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of very important symbiosis, and we've mentioned them already, but corals, Mm -hmm. to actually describe it for anyone who's unfamiliar, corals are cousins of sea anemones. If you zoom in on a coral, they have lots of little polyps that look like itty-bitty sea anemones with a mouth, lots of little tentacles that they can pull in food. But for many corals, that's not how they get most of their nutrition. Their bodies can house special algae called zooxanthellae, which is not one species, but is a group term for coral symbiosis algae. And this is another fundamental symbiosis that not only is good for setting up ecosystems, but is ecosystems that this symbiosis creates coral reefs. And it is so important and so effective with corals that there are many corals that don't eat. They just get food from their algae. If you're in tropical waters where the nutritional level in the water is very low, typically not as high as Arctic waters, you may not pull in much food at all and get almost all your nutrition from the algae living in your body. Yeah, this is an obligate symbiotic symbiotic relationship where you can't live without it. Yes. Or at least you can't live the way that you do. And that's on the corals part. Many of the zooxanthellae actually can live in the water fine, (laughs) which is why they leave when it gets too hot. Right. So they actually are doing quite well out in the water on their own, but still form this symbiotic relationship with the coral. And this is another example where Oftentimes when there's even a mutual relationship, it is not that one both need each other, but that they have come together. And it could be that one lured the other in and gave you a reason to come in. I'll house you, but I'm going to attract you. And now we are in symbiosis. Uh, So the zooxanthellae, I was fascinated the first time I learned that the zooxanthellae can just leave. I was like, well, then what happens then? They're like, then they're algae. And they're just doing the algae thing. Oh, Weird. (laughs) And once again, it means that for many corals, they have to collect zooxanthellae from the water before they can start growing and form that symbiosis. Uh, But there are some that include zooxanthellae in the egg. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So they're reproducing with their symbiont. Yeah. So they spread with, they are seeded with their symbiont. And it's, it depends coral to coral. And while we're on the note of 
environmentally fundamental symbiosis relationships, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and plants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what that means is nitrogen is very important to organic organisms. It's one of the six elements that they tell you is essential for all organismal life. And most of our nitrogen comes from the atmosphere in two. Two nitrogens bound together in a triple bond, which is very difficult to break. Right. And our chemical interactions in our bodies don't want to use two nitrogens at the same time. Mm -mm. You want one nitrogen that can do all the chemical interactions. So you have to break that triple bond. To give an example, often one of the things that breaks this bond is lightning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as we know, none of us eukaryotes, so that's us and plants. And fungi. And fungi cannot break this. Yeah. Uh, so plants have partnered with certain bacteria that have the capability to break down nitrogen, to fix it from atmospheric to usable. And they will not only grow alongside them in the soil, but make structures. They will have nodules to house the bacteria. Legumes, uh, mm -hmm. which include a lot of your things like peanuts and alfalfa and so forth, will have nodules to house the bacteria and give them a an enclosed space that's ideal for nitrogen fixation. Very cool. Well, and the fungus example here fits into this broader topic, which is always one of my thoughts when it comes to symbiosis, is mycorrhizae. Yep. Which are the fun root fungi, basically, that live alongside and around the roots of plants and help them gather nutrients and get all the stuff that they need so much so that I've heard it said that basically all plants have some relationship with fungus in the soil. Yes. And it has even been proposed that it may have been this relationship that helped plants first colonize land. Absolutely. And that is what's so fascinating to me about, you mentioned this uh, earlier, that symbiosis is kind of a rule. That it's not only that every now and then you get symbiosis, but lichens are a type of symbiotic relationship that helps found new ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And mycorrhizal fungi and these nitrogen-fixing bacteria are essential for ecosystem biomes like forests and places where there are lots of plants. And coral reefs, one of the most diverse, right, episode 36... Some of the most diverse and successful and important habitats on the planet are founded upon a symbiotic relationship. Absolutely. It's also a, a concept that, depending on how widely you want to define it, I saw one paper that said, depending on how you want to take in close association to mean, this could also include predator and prey. Yes. <laughs> like, I've seen that too. Yep. yep. That technically no organism lives alone. Yeah, there is a there is a long blurry spectrum from mutually beneficial to partially beneficial to partially harmful with parasitic, pathogenic and predatory yep. are all kind of in that same space. So it's a messy concept that includes a lot. A lot of the most famous examples are these very close, like physically we are growing together bonds. Uh, but you also do get others like bees and flowers, mm -hmm. where th these are organisms extremely closely linked, but not living on one another. No. The bees visit the flower, but there are flowers shaped for specific bees. And there are flowers that can only reproduce when helped by bees or their other pollinators. So that's absolutely mutualistic. It's not a symbiont living on a host. Right. And it, can, and it can be one, there, there are multiple individuals involved. Mm -hmm. The same flower will be visited by many, many pollinators, and each pollinator will visit many, many flowers. So you don't always have to be, we are bound at the hip. Uh, those are still symbiotic relationships, but most of them typically researched ones where you're going to see the term symbiosis in the title are going to look at ones more like this, yeah. where these two things are intricately bound to one another. Another of these fundamental relationships, and one you mentioned earlier when we were talking about how it is almost everywhere, every big organism is a host to smaller ones. 
many of those smaller organisms that we host are inside our gastrointestinal tract. Our gut microbiome. Yeah, sometimes called gut flora, even though they are not plants. Flora is a term that is often used to refer to all of the things that are not animals. Yep. Flora and fauna. Yes. Animal and vegetable. Yep. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) This is extremely common, and the number of things living inside each and every one of us animals is so huge. There are so many cells, like so many individuals, but also number of species that we have found in the guts of various organisms. Some numbers I found was that if you calculate out all the cells that make up a human, like if you were able to put us through a, a blender that would then sort out every yeah, individual it, it, cell. It's like those coin counters. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's counting the cells. Yeah. It would blink with a light for a little bit to make sure you knew it counted correctly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there is 10 to the 14th number of cells. So that's, that's a lot of zeros. 10 with 14 zeros. And about 10% of those are animal cells. <laughs> so most of you is not you. Yes. You are full of other things. <laughs> In there, roughly, I saw some that said 300, some that said 400 different species other than Homo sapiens. Yep. So if you did a DNA test (laughs) on that blended material. You would get a huge array of genomes to come back. And one of them would be you. Yes. This is so ubiquitous and such a huge percentage. Now, I saw different percentages, so you may find other numbers uh, that are slightly off. But either way, a huge amount of the actual cellular biomass of yourself is not human, which has led some to suggest the term holobiont to talk about and discuss units of these organizations instead of referring to us just as humans. Yeah, that's like having a word that refers to a building and then a word that refers to a building when it is full of people yes. and all the stuff that happens in that building. It's, there's the building and there's the business. Like, yeah, there's a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a building, which is, means something different than an office building, which means something different than the Roxxon building. Yes. Right. That, that implies all of what's going on inside. Yes, exactly. Holobiont would refer to you and all the organisms you're hosting. And all your friends. Everybody that you brought along. <laughs> all your plus ones. Ed Young wrote a book about the microbiome uh, a number of years ago, which was titled, I Contain Multitudes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly the concept. Now, of course, this term has been very controversial. Sure. Because the suggestion is that we use it as the unit instead of individual. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... Not everyone well, agrees that we well, can actually measure... <laughs> <laughs> things that way or that we should measure us alongside it well and you have to imagine that if you are trying to include all of our symbiotic partners that is a person that is me and all of my gut microbes and all of my other microbes that aren't in the gut and anything parasitic mm-hmm. that i happen to have inside me from whatever food i ate And all the stuff on my skin and in my hair, and that's microbes, and that's mites, and that's all this. And that stuff is constantly getting switched out with the environment, and it might depend on where I visited and what I ate, what countries I've been to recently. Absolutely. Some of it's parasitic. Some of it's mutualistic. Much of it is commensal. A lot of the stuff living inside you doesn't really help. It just is there, but it's not hurting you. And that often uh, is the case with a lot of pathogens. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the things that will make you sick are there most of the time. But if your health wanes or if certain conditions are met, that bacteria or whatever it is will start to spread enough to cause problems for you. Yes. For instance, that nitrogen fixing bacteria with the legume plants. The plant has to fight off the infection of that bacteria in the nodules <laughs> and keep it under control. Plants that don't do that become overtaken by this bacteria and suffer. So each of us is a world. Yes. A world of ecosystems. But in a galactic empire where we're constantly, where they're able to hop between. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're constantly getting visitors and they're constantly, they're leaving. Yep. Everyone you know is just Star Wars. Yep. Except some all the, the interesting characters are inside you. Some of them never leave their home Mm-mm. world. 
Others are popping all over the place. Yeah. Some worlds get visited way more often than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this gut microbiome is incredibly important in many regards. If you lost your gut microbes, you would stop being able to eat most things that you're used to eating mm-hmm. because they help us digest a ton of stuff. For instance, animals typically can't break down cellulose of plants, the thing that makes up the biggest building block of the cell wall of plants. Without that, you'd eat a carrot and chew it up and mush it up, and that mush would just travel through you. <laughs> All the way through. Because there's because you, you have nothing that can hurt it. <laughs> You need some microbes that are specialized in breaking down cellulose. And this is the case. You'll often hear this discussed with things like termites. Yep, uh, yep, yep. Animals that specifically eat certain types of plant material like wood often are able to do it because of the microbes inside them. But even for us, yes. even the amount of plant material we're eating. Yeah. Ruminants, your cows and your, your multi-stomach chambered uh, plant eaters are famous for their gut microbiome. And it allowing them to be extremely efficient at breaking down cellulose. Termites as well. It also helps us in bringing down meat. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is a big part in how we process our food. It's not just the acid in your stomach. So just like with your ecosystems full of plants that basically need their symbiotic relationship with fungi and bacteria, just like your coral reefs, just like your lichens, animal life as we know it, basically requires this entire ecosystem of endosymbionts to function. Yep. And then to wrap up the list of examples, just wanted to briefly mention that sometimes symbiosis is also super weird (laughs) and allows, like, you to have superpowers. (laughs) Bioluminescence. Yeah. Being able to light up is because of bacteria that lives inside the organisms that are lighting up. Yeah. In many cases, it is glowing bacteria. Mm -hmm. The organism, right, the fish or whatever it is, isn't making light. Yep, and one of the often studied organisms that does this, animals, is the bobtail squid, which is found off the coast of Hawaii and has uh, bioluminescent organs, which are sacs filled with bacteria, on the underside that simulate moonlight so that when you look at them from below, they blend in with the surface. Right. And it's super awesome. But what I really want to talk about is what I learned about baby bobtail squid, which are not born with their bacteria. Sure. And have to collect it from the water around them. Sure. So the bacteria itself is Vibrio fissurae and is just found in the water. Like these glowing bacteria are just found in the water. The baby squid are not born with their bacteria, so they have to collect it from the water around them. One paper I read said that the bacteria is only makes up about 0.001% of the bacteria in the water, so it is not common. It is very sparse compared to other bacteria. So the juvenile squid have special appendages with cilia, little hairs, to waft the bacteria toward them. And then as soon as they collect some of this glowing bacteria into their photophores, the light organs, the bacteria proliferates and reproduces quickly and fills the organ. And then the squid gives it nutrition from its body so that it can keep its colony alive. That's awesome. And then they lose those cilia appendages. Oh, because they have the bacteria. Because they have the bacteria. This is like, it, well, it makes me think of someone making a lantern by trapping a bunch of fireflies yes. inside a little jar. This is if it were that, but instead of a lantern, instead of a jar, it was a lab that supplied constant <laughs> nutrition to pr- provide for an entire po- ongoing population of fireflies. And instead of being a jar you hold, it is built into your body and you're born with it. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, fireflies also, if I remember correctly, don't make their own light. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they are also using endosymbiont, glowing endosymbiotes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there are any animals that produce glow by their own means. I think maybe jellyfish. Oh, maybe. Do it. I think they're, I'm thinking of the thing where they put, I think it was jellyfish genes in pigs and then the pigs glow. I right. think those were actually the jellyfish. Yes, I think genes. you might be right. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I don't think arthropods are tending to do it and vertebrates aren't doing it. Nope. 
There are all sorts. We could sit here for 10 hours and just list. Oh, yes. Examples of symbionts. We could talk about the the birds that eat off of rhinos that maybe are parasitic. Yeah. And we could talk about all the different arthropod relationships, vines on trees and... Uh, well, kudzu, they're your yep. favorite. <laughs> yep. <laughs> My favorite tree strangling plant. <laughs> well, before we move on, I do have one question for you, Will. This is personally for you as our <laughs> resident symbiote expert. <laughs> we talked about all the terms. Yep. Endosymbiont and ectosymbiont and uh, commensalism and mutualism and so on. And we've talked about that they're hazy. Mm-hmm. Venom <laughs> is a symbiote. Yep. Of Spider-Man and other hosts, <laughs> how would you classify Venom? Well, depending on the host, it depends on whether you consider the things Venom provides as beneficial. <laughs> uh, depends on whether you'd consider it parasitic or mutualistic. It is never commensal. <laughs> That's true. You always know. Yeah. It is either, you are either glad you have it or you hate you have it. No one is benignly walking around with a symbiote. <laughs> so parasitic, uh, classically, the Spider-Man relationship, yeah. at least eventually becomes <laughs> parasitic, is, so obviously uh, Venom I have seen depicted as both endosymbiotic and ectosymbiotic. Yep, yep, yep. It can move between the two. Yes. Is it endocytobiotic? In some cases, they have described it. Uh, in certain versions, it's like that they are perfectly blended that you, you if you took a sliver of eddie brock's finger it would have some of venom in it like mm. any part of him would have some of venom in it he is they are united fully and like cletus Cass- cassidy it's specifically in his bloodstream and that's what makes him so unique so they never cool. specify that it's inside the cells i do think there is one picture where it's showing it merging with his dna so the venom, venom, and its fellow symbiotes uh, fill, fill, fit all the categories. Yeah, basically, except for commensals. <laughs> they are never commensal, <laughs> ever. Parasitic, ever. predatory. Yeah, they're either feeding, <laughs> depending on which era of comic you read, they're either feeding off your emotions, sure. your brain juices, like your uh, 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 your cerebral spinal fluids, the and fluids such. and the the emotionally inducing chemicals. Oh, sure. Uh, like adrenaline and others that. Your other brain hormones. produces other hormones. And that's why they want to eat brains. Sure. Because it's just a, a vat full of those. <laughs> <laughs> but then they give you superpowers. Yeah. So. Mutualism. Mutualism. Maybe. Yeah. The psychosis in the <laughs> the, the <laughs> body horror that you're, is imposed on you could overwrite that depending on how picky <laughs> you are. I brought this up as a joke, obviously. You know, it's Venom, it's Spider-Man, it's Marvel Comics. But the way symbiotes, the fact that the term symbiote is used in Marvel Comics with Venom and with the other symbiotes is interesting because the way they're using it is in an extremely broad sense Yes. of all, you could use Venom as an example of basically all of the different facets of symbiosis. It's on the outside, it's on the inside, parasitic, uh, mutualistic, and all that stuff. Yeah. So it is actually kind of a cool example and also the way that people think about symbiosis yes absolutely uh fun you can add a couple more terms in that they are not specific symbiotes in that they do not have one preferred host that's true Uh, they can jump onto any host the movies added the whole thing that you have to have the perfect host but in the comics it's like yeah they could ride a gorilla around as long as they wanted (laughs) there are versions that use up their host and they are obligate symbiotes they can't survive without a host Right, right. The ones that use up their hosts uh, might be more accurately considered parasitoids. Yep, yep, yep. As we discussed in episode 102. Absolutely. There was a a clone chunk of venom that was a parasitoid for quite some time. (laughs) (laughs) So someday we'll do a whole episode and we'll just talk about Marvel symbiotes. Oh. Just for Will. Oh, you tease. We might, you know what? The rest of this episode. Never mind. (laughs) It's just this whole episode. (laughs) That's going to be one of our long episodes, I warn you. And then I'll do an episode about mutation. Yeah, there we Same go. Same vein. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you said, we could go on and talk about examples all day. But first, let's take a break. But let's not. But let's not. <laughs> but let's continue it a little bit after the break, but specifically in the past. 
Oh, right. This is a paleontology podcast. Yeah, I know. We are. We have backgrounds in that. Let's talk about fossils. So there are some fossil <laughs> examples, and we will discuss those after this musical interlude. So as is very typical when we talk about you know, behavioral or evolutionary trends in the fossil record. Uh, our fossil record of symbiosis ain't great mm. because finding a fossil example of two organisms living in close concert with one another is not common. No. And it's really difficult to infer behavior and lifestyle from the fossil record, yeah. generally speaking. Like, even when we are able to say... They were definitely symbiotic. We can almost never say whether it was parasitic, mutual, or commensal. Yeah. Because you're not able to watch if benefit is being traded. So there's there are examples, but they're not well-defined in what was going on. So it it is still very murky in the history of certain symbiotic relationships. Right. But there is so research. It becomes even harder to classify them into those hazy boxes that we talked about. <laughs> when something starts blurry and then you go back <laughs> a few million years, it gets real blurry. By far, the earliest evidences of symbiotic relationships go back to the Cambrian. Uh, there are a number of different examples. Uh, one of the most common are called bioclostrations, which are indents in the body or skeleton of marine creatures where something had been living on them. Oh, okay. So like on a shell, for example, you might have a little space where another thing once lived. Yes. And these are typically different than if something bored into the shell. Right. And we've talked about that when we had uh, Ranjivan mm -hmm. about actual bore holes through shells that like predators will leave. Yes. This And there are things that will bore in and then settle down. You know, That's not true. to eat, but like to live inside you. Right. Like I'm, a bot fly. Like a bot fly. Ugh. This is something where I settled down on you, and then you'd continue to grow and grew around me. Oh, like a tree growing around a pole or something. Exactly. And you can tell a difference in the cross-section structure of these holes, whether it was boring or whether it was a bioclostration. And the reason that's important is because boring can happen, like boring a hole can happen very quickly and doesn't mean you were living together for a long time. Right. You were just on your way through. Yeah. So it may not have really been a very symbiotic relationship. It may have just been a brief relationship. But if you were growing around my body, then, oh yeah, we were there for a while. It makes me think of galls mm -hmm. and tree, tree branches and, and like sticks and twigs where you'll get the tree, a, a special structure has grown around an insect or whatever living inside the wood. Absolutely. These are found on a variety of host organisms. Sponges and corals are by far some of the most common, but a lot of your sedentary, immobile, locked to the seafloor organisms can get these bioclostrations, crinoids. And whilst we don't know for sure what the relationship was, most people say it was most likely commensal. But it could have, there could be a mutualistic or parasitic, you know, skew to some of them. And we can't say what was typically hiding out in that hole. We can study the trends in diversity because various shapes and hosts and numerousness, the how common they are in the fossil record. So we do have some evolutionary track records for this kind of symbiosis. For instance, there are notable pulses in diversity and abundance in the late Ordovician and middle Devonian, which sync up with increases in boring traces as well. So the behavior of encrusting and boring into these hard-bodied organisms followed pulses together. Interesting. So we don't have a ton of info about early, early, you know, the, the basis of animal symbiosis, but we can get some info and we can follow trends, mm -hmm. e even if we don't have a lot of specific details, we have a lot of broad data. Absolutely. Uh, we do get some examples of seeing organisms together in Cambrian fossils. From the Burgess Shale, there was an example of 30 tubes that contained acorn worms and polychaete worms, 
all occupying the tubes. Most interpret that the tubes were dug by the acorn worms, but were also occupied by polychaetes. Okay, so they came in to live alongside them. Yeah. Once again, probably just commensal, that they were probably just using up the shelter, but not actually, you know, doing anything bad while they were there. But this does seem to be a symbiotic shelter relationship between these two worms. There are a few examples of direct host-symbiote relationship in fossils of two Cambrian worm species that have been infested, adhered to by smaller organisms Ooh. onto their body. Like barnacles on a whale. Yeah. It's just little things on these worms. Except these things are weird. Ooh. The two worms are... Oh boy. Cricocosmia and Mafangskolex worms. So those... <laughs> <laughs> cool names. They are pretty neat. Which were infested by an organism that was named... Oh boy. Inquicus phalatus. There you go. So these worms had these smaller organisms that were described as bowling pin shaped with a suction cup tip to one of their ends Ooh. adhered to the skin of these two different species of worm. Now they don't know for sure what was going on. They don't think it was parasitic because as far as they can tell from the anatomy, the mouth was on the opposite end of the suction cup. Okay. And the suction cup doesn't seem to be breaking the skin at all. It is so just, they were, they were just attached, stuck on there. So they may have just been using them as a perch to feed from the water column. Uh, since some of the worms have up to like 15 of these on their body, it could have been for breeding to spawn. And so they climbed these worms mm. to act, congregate and breed since they do see similar behaviors like that in other symbiosis relationships. But they don't actually know what's going on. It's just there are pictures of the fossil in, in the articles it's just a worm covered in little bowling pin things. Weird. And it's super weird looking, but it's <laughs> definitely symbiosis. Yeah. <laughs> I also remember a study from not too long ago, and we might have talked about this in episode 102 about parasites, of examples of Cambrian, I think these were brachiopods, or, or maybe they were bivalves, but some shelled organisms that had worms growing on them. Oh, yeah. With the head of the worm facing the food intake section of the shelled or of the, the brachiopods. And the researchers noted that the brachiopods with worms on them tended to be smaller. So it might have been that these were parasitic sitting on top of them and stealing a bunch of their food on the way in. Yeah. So we've got, that's a yet another probable symbiotic, well, certainly symbiotic and maybe even parasitic relationship. Which is, and it's a cool one. The yeah, trend it's, a, of, it's a kleptoparasitic relationship, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> we've also been able to look at signs indicating symbios, symbiotic relationships that we're aware of, like in corals. Ah. Corals have been around for a very long time. The algae does not fossilize, but there are features we can look at to see if maybe trends between photosynthetic and aphotosynthetic corals might persist in the fossil record. Because not all corals today have algae, because if you live deep down where there's no sunlight, you don't need it. Uh, deep sea corals. So deep sea cold water corals, as they're called, only feed because they can't photosynthesize. So they've looked at those corals versus the normal corals we typically think of for the signal of the nitrogen isotopes in these two, which there is a difference. Mm. And then we can look at fossil coral to potentially be able to identify at least where symbiotic algae were most likely present. We don't know what color they would have been. We still don't know. Sure, sure. But they probably had a symbiotic relationship with algae. Cool. So you can look at a coral in the fossil record and go, yeah, this probably had photosynthesizing algae with it based on these features. Exactly. And there have been corals from the Miocene identified to very likely have algae because they have the exact same nitrogen isotope signals as today's. Cool. So we are able to kind of gaze backwards, even though we don't have fossil physical evidence in the structure or anything. But it, it sure does chemically look like <laughs> the same kind of situation. And then finally, we do have examples of preserved fossil relationship between plants and the mycorrhiza. 
uh, the fungus. So we do have fossilized moments or examples where, yes, definitely this plant had a relationship with fungus. It's not common, which is bizarre considering that basically every plant today does it. Mm -hmm. So it's that makes it very tricky you know, to study, it's not likely that it wasn't common, just we don't fossilize, it doesn't fossilize well. But there are a few fossils. Uh, one that I found, I saw noted a couple of times was a, a Triassic fossil from Antarctica that preserved this relationship. So we know at least that far back for sure. <laughs> but the but the earliest evidence of plant fungal interactions actually date back to the, from the Rainy Chert 407 million years ago. In Scotland. In Scotland. And this is, uh, th this fossil, as well as how common it is, lends credence to that idea that if fungus were not integral in getting plants onto land, they were very important in forming those first land plant ecosystems. Yeah. But there are some who think that without fungus, we might not have gotten land plants as we know them. So it's it's a very old symbiotic relationship, both based on the evidence of today's relationships between plant and fungus and the fossil record. Yeah, I think it's not a coincidence that the sites we often end up talking about with these are the Rhiney Chert, the Burgess Shale, places with exceptional preservation. And in addition to a lot of the these sim broader symbiotic relationships, we discussed in episode 102 that there are tons of examples, well, tons, but many, several examples of parasitic relationships yes. in the fossil record. We've talked about bugs on dinosaur feathers and things found inside other things and those parasitoid wasps inside the cocoons. There are uh, a good handful of fascinating examples of those. So we do get these parasitic relationships. And then sometimes we will hypothesize them. Mm -hmm. I know I've seen the uh, artists reconstruct like small pterosaurs riding around on dinosaurs like birds will do with big mammals today. Yep, yep. I know there has been discussion about the historical evolutionary relationship between modern animals and their parasites or symbiotes. There was a study, oh, this was several years ago now, that looked at human body lice and head lice and looked at the evolutionary history of body lice to try to see if they could infer when clothing started <laughs> being worn, since that's where... These lice will often live. Yeah. So there's been a lot of cool studies about the historical relationship between organisms and uh, speculating on how ancient organisms could have been symbiotically linked. Yes. And it's worth noting that going back to our discussion about how some of these terms are not always used the same way, many of those parasitic fossil examples won't come up when you search symbiosis in the fossil record right because uh, they're parasites because they're parasites typically commensal and mutualistic are the ones that are going to actually come up in those searches yeah and that's not even to mention our examples episode 84 of diseases in the fossil record mm -hmm. of pathogens which also will not typically come up when you look for symbiosis but broadly speaking yeah that's also a relationship between two organisms yes it is <laughs> Now, while the fossil record of symbiosis can be difficult to murky, you know, with some really good examples, we still study the evolution of symbiosis constantly. And it is a very interesting topic because it's different situation to situation. And there are some extreme cases of evolution in symbiosis. One question that has been asked is how does beneficial symbiosis get started? Like things living near each other make sense just proximity, but how do you form a codependent relationship where you are both benefiting from the other? You know, what is required for that to evolve, you know, to become established, and what is evolved for it to then be selected for? And there are three things that typically get listed. A, a currency, the thing that you're getting from one another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you trading? Yes. What's your barter system? Are you giving the nutrients from photosynthesis? Are you giving protection? Are you giving a home? What are you two benefiting from and what are you giving? The second is a mechanism for trading. Mm -hmm. So some way to give the useful thing to one another. And then finally is a method of inheritance. Yeah. And this is the important part 
if I have a symbiotic relationship with something, but then I have kids and they don't, then that symbiism doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> that, that doesn't continue because my kids didn't get it. So yeah, that was a one-off. You were just a weird guy. We were just friends. <laughs> <laughs> you were just roommates. Yeah. And so like, you have to have a way to pass it on for it to be inherited. Uh, currencies are often heavily studied because there are many situations where it may not immediately be obvious what the currency is or that there is a currency at all. Like these two things definitely live together and it sure, it looks like it should be mutualistic considering how tight the bond is, but we don't actually know what A is getting from B. We B is obviously, you know, getting stuff or something, but we're not sure that there's anything going the other way. So trying to figure that out is very important in identifying different symbiotic relationships the currency can be very, very complex. There are many cases where an endosymbiote, like a bacteria or, or microorganism inside the host, actually provides defenses, you know, toxins, or fights off disease. Like, your microbiome is part of your immune system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which you almost never gets discussed, but it is. So sometimes the currency is not something we typically think of. And it's services. It's services, yeah. <laughs> Goods and services. Exactly. <laughs> there are also multiple forms of inheritance. We've already discussed a few because there are some symbiotic relations where every time that a new generation is born, they have to reacquire. Right, like those the squid. Yep. They have to get the bacteria back and they have to, or a, you know, algae has to find its host every time. But then there are many situations where the host and symbiote and the host and their symbiote travel down the generations together. These are known as horizontal and vertical inheritance. Right. Horizontal being from the environment, you have to get your symbiote back every time. Vertical being from typically mother to offspring. Right. There's still diversity even in the vertical where it could be that it's in the egg. Right. Like you're literally born with it. And sometimes it's while you're being born. <laughs> You know, when the amnion bursts in birth, it, it introduces a lot of your microorganisms to you. You know, or it could be that after you're born, mm -hmm. you get a lot of it. That's, uh, I think it's koalas that have to eat the the fecal material of their mother to get a lot of their microbiome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that in the case of humans with our microbiome, I, I am not, I don't know this off the top of my head, but I feel like I've heard of it happening in many different ways at many different... I think some of it is environmental and yeah. some of it is being in proximity with a parent and sharing that microbiome. Well, I believe uh, uh, breast milk carries mm -hmm. a, a good portion of it. I think so. Uh, but there's a bunch where it's like, while you're in the womb, you don't have a lot of it. And in the process of being born, like yeah, that you are exposed. instant, you are suddenly exposed. You are awash in a microbiome. This has also led to suggestions as to what order these things happen in. You know, is it more important that you have a currency before you're inheriting? Or is it more important that you're inheriting and then the currency can come later? Those are basically the two ideas that first you have a currency, you start benefiting from one another, and then eventually inheritance is introduced or it becomes a, a feature that is selected for. Now we want to keep you around. That we're now that you're a, you're helpful, I want you to be with my kids too. <laughs> but there are hypotheses that go with transmission or inheritance first. That you form a stable relationship just and it could be accidental that I, this microbe gets inside me and then I accidentally pass it to my kid and they accidentally pass it to their kid and it just well, well now we're stably symbiotic. And then something happens and a benefit comes from it. Right. Well, if we think about the microbiome, that is a case where I, I can only imagine that you would have to try extremely hard to not end up with microbes living inside you. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know how you would avoid. You live in the earth. They're everywhere. It, it, it's all over the place. So you could easily end up in a situation where they're just inside and you end up passing it along, you know, you have a baby and you happen to be in close proximity with the baby or the baby is born inside of a womb and the womb there it is exposed to some of your body or you lay an egg and it came from you. So it's getting some microbes with it and that vertical transmission can easily just be there. Yep. 
And it's also easy to see how a relationship with those microbes inside you could, over time, develop into, you know, if there are microbes inside you that are providing some tiny benefit, then generation to generation, a species may be selected for a feature on the interior or a certain aspect of your immune system or something that helps keep them around which might then encourage selection for the most helpful ones. Yep. And you can see it running away with, yes, the organisms that happen to have features that are beneficial for their interior microbes. But if those mechanisms benefit the most beneficial of the microbes, well, now we've got selection for the microbes to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And either way, you can see how it can, in in the way that evolution semi-accidentally comes up with stuff, can come about yes and it's absolutely the case that all of these situations are happening and have happened depending on which group or which pairing you're looking at basically any symbiotic relationship you can think of has evolved multiple times it's not one group of animals started having one symbiotic relationship with a bacteria and then all descendants it can be lost and rediscovered or new symbiotic relationships happen. So it is a constantly shifting, constantly being evolved between organisms. Another concept that is often discussed in the evolution of mutualistic, you know, beneficial symbiosis is the division of labor between the two organisms uh, or, you know, minimum of two between the organisms involved that often what you will see happening is that they are now sharing in the requirements of survival they're not neither one is doing all the work you know that they would normally be doing they start dividing up the labor now the reason this is so interesting is that when that happens if you're separated that is actually potentially very dangerous Mm -hmm. that could be a detriment you might die without your host or your symbiote so why would you evolve that if they're especially for you that are born without it like right well, you'd think that that would be a, an easy evolutionary dead end. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, if you evolve or or how or or easy to not be sustained, that it, 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 it almost feels like, well, yeah, one hard winter. Yes. And everyone loses the symbiotes. And yeah, your selective pressure is gone. So how would that maintain? And this has been kind of a, a, a paradoxical aspect of mutualism, especially intense mutualism, where you rely on each other. But both research into it and just how common it is shows that it is beneficial enough and stable enough that even with the every single generational threat of not finding your symbiote, of being born and just not getting the bacteria you need and just being completely out of luck is not enough to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. So it really goes to show how important symbiosis is to just the functioning of life that even when it is inconvenient, it still happens. It still comes about very, very often. Which then, of course, leads into once you've had this symbiote inside you or on you or whatever, for generations and generations and generations, you are going to evolve together. You're going to co-evolve. Mm-hmm. It's basically unavoidable. And there's tons of examples where we see co-evolution. You know, we talked about bees and their flowers, the pollinators and the flower often co-evolve to either be better or exclusive to one another. But we can also see it down to the genetic level, not just that we can see, oh, genetic trends that, yes, you know, changes are happening, but in some insects that have reliance on their symbionts, there is notable decrease in the genome of those bacteria, that they've lost a lot of their genome, very much to the point where they are fundamentally reliant on the insect now they're lacking certain genetic functions because it's being provided elsewhere exactly they're not a whole bacteria anymore (laughs) (laughs) they're only as much as they need to be to do their part of the job and benefit from living in the insect well it makes me think of like you know i mentioned head lice and body lice and you think of uh, there are a number of examples of parasites that are so specific to their host that they can't function outside of the host Mm mm-hmm because their physical features or something it's like, yeah, this this body shape is great for crawling through hair. Yep. But once you're out of the hair, you're out of luck. You are completely out of your depth. This is that, but with genetic changes. Yes. 
down down to uh, genome size. And as is to be expected when you are that closely linked, you also diversify together. Yeah. I know there's been multiple research into that happening with lice. Yes. Yeah. Where, with both, I think, with humans as well as with birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe some mammals that's been done. That as a species of host begins to diverge into multiple to speciate, their symbiotes, those riding along on and in them, have basically no option but to split into, you know, population-wise, their population gets split between these two new species. Allopatrically speciating, episode 98. And once you're separated, yeah, you can speciate just like they did. So you end up with a case where, let's use birds as an example, because I know it's been done. You'll have a handful of bird species and the lice that live on them, and their evolutionary trees are the same shape. Yep. That, yeah, these two bird species diversified at the same time as the two species of lice on them, that they split at the same time. The same thing has been noted with aphids and the bacteria that lives inside them to allow them to process the plant material they they siphon out. And that same thing, the same patterns of diversification are seen in both the aphid and the bacteria. And this actually brings us back to that concept of the holobiont. This is why it was suggested, is that really we shouldn't be considering the evolution of this bird, but this bird and its microorganismal community. Mm -hmm. The entire package should be considered as the unit of natural selection and evolution. We We can't separate them. That's the idea behind that concept. And there is some research support that you can, in certain cases, really consider it as a unit. But not all symbioses are built equally. Right. You know, another symbiotic relationship might really not affect the evolution of its host notably. You know, even if they are very closely, you know, uh, associated, they might not, when you actually look at the trend, really seem to affect it at all. And in that case, well, then should we consider them together? If you're not making a difference, then does it actually help to include that data? One of the big aspects that often makes or breaks the the validity of this term and how useful it is, is whether there is direct vertical transfer or inheritance. When there isn't, the, it doesn't really seem to hold up. Mm-hmm. When there is, then, okay, well, yeah, if you're transferring it... Right. You are reproducing together, basically. Then, yeah, what is the difference between them just being one of your cells? Right, and in which case... We're not just looking, because in evolution, we're never looking at an individual. Nope. Right? We're looking at populations, typically, uh, when we're talking about evolutionary trends and natural selective trends. So instead of it being a population of one species and the things they interact with in their environment, it's a population of hundreds of species. Yes. If you're accounting all the microbes and stuff, lots of species and their interactions with each other and with the host and with the environment around them. That's a lot of variables. Yes. And that's one of the big things that uh, I've seen suggested when this idea was brought up is that when we do a genome study of a species, we should be including all their genomes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, but all thousand genomes. Yeah. Like, you really shouldn't just consider only my DNA. You should consider all the other DNA that's in me as well because it matters. And because it's unique. Mm -hmm. Everyone's microbiome is going to be unique. Every species' microbiome is going to be different from every other species. But as mentioned beforehand, this is still not a a widely used or or accepted, and it's very controversial to consider it this way. So this is being proposed. It came up in a number of the papers Mm -hmm. where they're like, this has been mentioned, and that's as much as we're going to say. It's it's interesting because the microbiome is a concept that I think has been getting a lot more recognition and research attention recently. Yes. Right? Recent years, recent decades. So the idea of a holobiont is a relatively new concept. Yeah. So this is one of those fun things. You know, whenever we say this is controversial, this is uncertain, what we mean, you know, often when we say, oh, yeah, this hypothesis is controversial, we don't often mean... Uh, people are being offended by it. No. You know, we don't, we don't mean that this is, well, this is a political issue. What we mean is not everybody agrees. And what that really means is this is a concept we're still working out. Yes. We're still discussing this. This is a discussion that's happening right now among scientists of how do we deal with this 
fact of reality. How do we deal with these relationships? How does that factor into our studies and the way that we consider organisms and organismal evolution? What are the complications? Does it make sense to include everything? Does it make sense not to? This is a discussion that's happening now. This is yes. this is the leading edge of scientific discussion. Absolutely. And it's fitting because even when we were just talking about the individual organism, you know, animal or plant, even in those cases, we were still talking about symbiosis mm -hmm. because one of the most fundamental aspects of symbiosis that we deal with is the fact that your cells are not all you, every single one of them, <laughs> because mitochondria and chloroplast are pretty widely believed to have originally been separate bacteria that became encapsulated and then part of the cell biology. So we're bringing it all the way back around to the discussion we had earlier about how symbiosis is fundamental. Mm -hmm. like forests don't exist without symbiosis and individual, every individual animal is a symbiotic relationship with all these microbes. The idea that the cells of animals, plants, fungi are themselves only exist as a result of a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Without symbiosis, there aren't eukaryotes. This is the endosymbiosis theory. Absolutely. This is based off the fact that when you look inside our cells and plant cells and other eukaryotes, you find some organelles, mitochondria and chloroplasts, and there are other potentials, but those are the two big ones. Right. Organelles are any of the, basically it's a cell's version of organs. Yeah. All the, your Golgi apparatus and your vacuoles and your nucleus, all the pieces, the bits inside of a cell. That make it work. Chloroplasts, which are the ones that run photosynthesis, photosynthetic business yep. inside plant cells, and mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cell. Yep. Uh, which are actually found in animals and plants. Yes. And fungi, uh, if I remember correctly. And mitochondria are the ones that make ATP, which is how we transfer energy throughout our body. Right. Kind of important. When you look at these, there are a number of features that stand out that suggest that they are not of this organism. <laughs> One is simply they look like bacteria. Yeah. They're the same size. They're the same shape. They don't look like other plant animal cells. You know, they look like a bacteria. So they're the right shape for it yeah they have the right physical feature each mitochondrion and chloroplast it physically resembles a bacterium yeah there's also a disproportionate number of them in that one one of your cells could have hundreds of mitochondria in it instead of having typically you know the set um you know units right. one nucleus one cell yeah mitochondria there can be a ton and they replicate on their own yes inside your cell they have their own reproductive process which is because they have their own dna your mitochondria we've talked about this in dna discussions in mm -hmm. episode 34 for example each one of your cells your human cells has nuclear dna which is the dna housed in your nucleus and mitochondrial dna which is a separate batch of dna for your mitochondria plant chloroplasts i believe have their own chloroplast dna as absolutely well absolutely they do mm -hmm. and so and so all these features together really started making people go, I, that looks like a bacteria that got stuck. Yeah. And indeed, uh, if I remember correctly, mitochondria and chloroplast DNA is also arranged the same way. Yes. That it's a, I forget what it's called. Is it a plasmid? It's that ring of DNA is often how it's depicted. But it's not chromosomes like in our nuclei. It is a different arrangement of DNA, which is what we see in bacteria. Yep. So this has led to the endosymbiotic hypothesis of the origin of these organelles being that early eukaryote-like cells, not eukaryotes yet, at some point formed an intercellular relationship with these bacteria. So very quickly, all life is broken down into eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic mm -hmm. cells. Eukaryotes are animals, plants, fungi, and other eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are your bacteria and all of their things. Prokaryotic cells tend to be very simple. They tend not to have a nucleus. The wall of the cell is a different structure. They tend to be very small, yes. relatively. Eukaryotic cells have a different structure. They tend to be large, and they tend to be full of different organelles, including nuclei, all those other things, and mitochondria and chloroplasts. Yes, and it, 
the thought is that a cell not quite like a eukaryote's, but very close, absorbed or was invaded by these bacteria that could photosynthesize and could process ATP, and then over time became integrated to live with one another permanently. And when they would reproduce, they would reproduce together, yep. and that they would not be separated. And so this is a very extreme form of that loss of genome that we mentioned before, where it's these two things don't exist without one another. If you take out the mitochondria, that cell's dying. Right. And if you put that mitochondria in a Petri dish by itself, it's not going to persist. And this is similar to the lichen situation where you, you meant the way you put it, which I thought was really cool, is you have algae slash cyanobacteria and fungus together making a thing. In this case, the hypothesis is that the eukaryotic cell is a thing formed by a symbiotic relationship. Yes. Our entire group of the tree of life mm -hmm. is because of this symbiotic relationship. So it's fundamental. <laughs> and I like the idea because you've got with the microbiome, the notion that, yeah, if you live on the earth, you're going to be full of bacteria and other microbes. And you're going to develop a relationship that is now inseparable. Inseparable, like you can still point at all the microbes inside yourself. You can identify the different separate organisms. Yes. But as a unit, you don't operate without each other. Similar with the mycorrhizae and the trees and, and other plants. That showed up so long ago that even though you can still note the distinction, you can see where one organism ends and the other begins... They are basically inseparable. We owe our modern plant-based biomes to this relationship. Lichens are an entire group of organisms that are so inseparable that we identify them together. We give them their own species names. It took a long time for scientists to recognize, right, in the late 1800s, for scientists to finally go, oh, this is actually multiple species of completely different groups of life. Yep. They are so bound together. Here is yet an even more <laughs> extreme example that are very, at some point, you know, a couple billion years ago. Yeah, most things put it at right around a billion years. Two different groups of life developed this symbiotic relationship that has become so fundamental that it is the foundation for eukaryotic life yep that the existence of plants animals and fungi and all of our protozoan eukaryote friends is possible because of this symbiotic relationship because each and every one of the cells in our body that belong to us yep. each one of our human cells has a cell and inside of it a bunch of what billions of years ago <laughs> ancestrally were a separate independent group of microbes and that this partnership of symbionts has become so inextricable that it's almost ridiculous to think of them as separate yeah like with with lichens it's like oh wow we didn't even notice with the eukaryotic cell it's ridiculous to think but how how could you conceive of separating these things yes exactly like it, there's a reason every picture of a cell you ever saw in a science textbook is just like and then there's the mitochondria moving up powerhouse that, of the cell that, that, yep <laughs> that's just part of the cell <laughs> that's just what it does Th there's the chloroplast the thing that allows plants to photosynthesize yep <laughs> to harvest the sun that is a fundamental aspect of our nature yes of plants of, of the, animals the global biosphere <laughs> that's that's like if we discovered that our brains were actually ancestrally a symbiote like <laughs> what that's ridiculous how could that be a separate thing ancestrally that's so weird yes exactly <laughs> so so symbiosis is kind of important yeah. Is your mind blown? <laughs> <laughs> it really, this is, this really is one of those topics where it's like, yeah, let's spend an hour and a half or so discussing this utterly fundamental, ubiquitous, inseparable from life as we know it concept uh, and see how much we get. Yeah. Well, it's like when we did origins of life and it's like, all right, first, what does it mean to be alive? Yep. Everyone like, 
What does that mean to you individually? <laughs> and we got to get to some of the real foundational questions of life. Yes, of just how things exist here on our planet. There's, as always, tons more that can be discussed here. So if we did not get to a specific aspect of this topic that you'd oh, like yeah. us to, please let us know. Request the more specifics or the the topics within this topic we couldn't delve into. Please do. I'm pretty sure uh, up until that endosymbiosis bit right there at the end, we hadn't even talked about microbes being symbionts inside other microbes. Nope. Which is its own whole thing. That's its a whole. That's a whole <laughs> category. Because we are very macroscopically biased. Yep. Yep. As we don't have microscope. We we too personally don't have microscopes good enough. Right. I just have one little dissecting microscope. <laughs> it's not very good. Also, like, let us know your favorite example of symbiosis. Please flood our social media. That would be awesome. And, our, and the Discord mm-hmm. and our Patreon. Yep. Give us all your favorite symbiosis examples. Uh, tell us your favorite symbiote from the Marvel comics. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and yeah, let us post know your if... full reviews of the Venom movie. Yeah. Oh, yes. I will. <laughs> I will read those. Oh man, we're gonna get those. <laughs> As usual, if you want to hear more, let us know. But before we go on to the outro, we do have one section left, which is our patron question. That's right. We have a symbiotic relationship. With our patrons. Yes, it is It is commensal in that it's they It's mutualistic, give... <laughs> I like to think. I sure hope it's mutualistic. <laughs> we have a bunch of parasites on the internet. No, I'm kidding. Of course. No, we are the parasites. <laughs> <laughs> our patrons uh, give us all sorts of financial support and also like moral and emotional support. Oh, so much. <laughs> and one of the rewards at a certain level is you get to ask us questions. So every episode... We pull one of those aside. What is our question for this episode? Here's a question that is somewhat fitting. (laughs) This question comes from Anna. Are there any species alive today, other than domesticated animals like dogs, cats, and livestock, that, should the entire human race get wiped out suddenly, would die off because they were so dependent on humans to keep them alive? Fantastic question. And very fitting question. So if humans were blipped... Yep, if we get snapped out of existence, yeah, all of us. All of us, not half. What wouldn't make it other than the things we've domesticated and created? Right. Uh, and there are a number of things that would definitely be on that list. First and foremost, that comes to mind, all of our symbionts, perhaps. Yeah. All, all, right. the, all the ones that need us. Yes, all of our internal and many of our, like, on our skin and body external yes. symbiotes would cease to exist without us well i think like human body lice and head lice to bring those back around again are very specifically adapted to living on humans yes from what i've heard uh which now gives me the picture of if we were snapped out of existence but only humans would there just be piles <laughs> just of <pile>. bacteria <laughs> that just slump to the ground if you snap the human out of existence would there just be a little cloud of dust <laughs> that would fall to the ground that's what it was that's what it was in the movie. That's the du- oh, there the you go. The dust was all the symbiotes. Was all the uh, 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 crows blowing away. Oh, Okoye was surrounded by that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Avengers Endgame, by the way, <laughs> or Infinity War, I guess. <laughs> so, absolutely, tons of things would go extinct if we went extinct because we are units. Yes, we are a holobiont, mm-hmm. according to some. <laughs> I did find a list of potentially other things, which is a, it was a kind of paradoxical list in that there are animals that are surviving today only because we are maintaining their population. Right. Not like chickens and house cats and stuff. Well, house cats are going to be fine. Yeah. But like the domesticated ones. And these include things like condors and the golden frog, where these are wild animals that are on their way to extinction and are not reaching it because we intervened to help them out. Now, the reason we had to intervene with most of these (laughs) is because we were helping them on their way to extinction. Someone messed it up. So Someone broke the species. Yes, exactly. So some of those are very close, like like 400 individuals. Right. Like very, uh, the golden frog is completely in human care. Yes. We went and caught all the ones we could find and have been taking care of them inside facilities and they're extinct in the wild. Mm -hmm. So if we go extinct, if we suddenly disappear, the golden frog's almost surely going with us. Right. Because we're not going to be paying the electric bills for their heat lamps anymore (laughs) and they're going to die. 
But like condors, once we stop putting buckshot into their food. Right. <laughs> Maybe they'll be okay. They might bounce back just fine, but maybe they're maybe they've bottlenecked too much without our, con- you know, uh, focused breeding and focused care that they would also eventually go extinct. It makes me wonder about like, well, there was that story not too long ago of a species of mosquito that had evolved, or maybe it was a subpopulation that had evolved within like what was it, the London Underground system or something oh, like yeah. that. So there may very well be animals that have adapted so well. Not to living with us, but to living in our structures. Yes. Like, it makes me think, it makes me wonder if there is any species. Because there are some species that are very restricted, right? You live on this, these five trees, and that's it. It makes me wonder if there are any similarly restricted species where the entire population happens to live downstream from a dam. Yep. Which, if humans were blipped out of existence and eventually the dam fails... And floods that area, is that species going to be gone? Yeah. Because we made a situation that is no longer maintainable that they were relying on to survive. And there are definitely tons that would take major hits. You know, whether or not they'd go extinct is hard to say. But like pigeons. Yeah. Pigeon populations would plummet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of rodents that have made their uh, homes and basements and, and around human structures. Yep. Makes me wonder about those fungi that have adapted to feed on radiation, like the (laughs) Chernobyl fungi. Yeah. How long is that? Well, I guess it's how long is that radiation going to linger around? They'll probably hang on for a long time. (laughs) And then (laughs) once we stop digging up radioactive material. So, yeah. So it would have, there there would be a good handful. And of course, on top of that, all the domesticated animals. Yes. As I say. So, so for everyone out there that says we are the virus. There would be things that missed us. Right. Well, because we have, it's like, I think we talked about this in episode 102, that there are hosts that have adapted to the existence of their parasite. Mm -hmm. Such that if, I think you mentioned that there are examples where the parasite now fills a gap. That if you took the parasite away, it would cause problems in the body. Yeah. Because it was plugging a hole or, you know, something more biologically realistic. (laughs) But it was filling a void or it was taking up a specific space that now is empty and it's a problem. That's what we've done. Yes. Yeah. We have fitted ourselves into this. Yeah, we say that. We are. We were born here. Mm -hmm. We are are of the earth. Yeah. We are an ecto symbiont. Yes, exactly. Endo. Endo. We are an ecto. We are on the outside of the earth. <laughs> Miners are endosymbionts. Right, exactly. Yes. And spelunkers. <laughs> people who live in basements. <laughs> Great question. Excellent. That was a very, very good question, especially for this episode. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to everyone who requested this episode. Yes. Thank you to all of our patrons. Thank you to every patron who has submitted a patron question, whether we have already answered it or whether it is remaining on our list for a future episode. And thank you to everyone who listens. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. As as we said earlier, if you have questions or comments or requests in relationship to this, you can get in contact with us in all the usual ways, email, social media, so forth. You can even mail stuff to us. You sure can. Also, as a reminder, we have a Discord server now, Common Descent Discord. You can find that in the episode description if you want to join the community there. Another place where you can interact with other fans and us on occasion. Also, be sure, if you haven't already, to check out our Zazzle store, where we've got a bunch of cool new art in celebration of our five-year anniversary. It's pretty awesome. The more responses we get to stuff like that, the more sales we make, the more likely we are to be able to do more of that stuff in the future. So Mm -hmm. if you enjoy these things we do... Be sure to participate and let us know. And as always, we release episodes every fortnight. Sure do. This symbiotic relationship will continue. (laughs) I I was commensal this episode. (laughs) (laughs) I was just hanging around over here. (laughs) We'll see you next time. Goodbye for now. All of our symbionts out there in the world. (laughs) You holobionts, you. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye to you and to your multitudes. (laughs) Tell them we say hi. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. 
Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.